سلام علیکم سلام علیکم رحمت الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم All praises of Allah's Lord of the world May his peace and blessings be upon our master the Holy Prophet Muhammad and his pure immaculate and unbeat Continuing from the theme of repentance to obey We've discussed what the essence of repentance is and what it constitutes. And we started with the tradition from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam where he described repentance as the root of Allah. And we tried to explain what that meant when repentance is the root of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah, we'll continue from that tradition as we progress during the talk. I first want to go through a few fiqhi rulings on repentance, which may be of some use to you. The first issue is whether tawbah and repentance, is it necessary? Is it vajib? And here, we can answer this question from an aqli point of view and also from verses in the Holy Quran. In chapter 24, verse 31, ila Allah so turn to Allah in repentance, all of you, O believers. Whoever qualifies as a believer, all of you, turn to Allah in repentance, so that you may acquire or attain to salvation. So if you are a believer, from the very lowest degree, to the degree of the prophets, repentance is necessary. But the question is, what does this repentance mean? Is the repentance of the normal believer one and the same as the repentance of the intermediate believer, as the repentance of the prophets? Even if you're a prophet, you still qualify as one of the mu'mineen and therefore it's necessary for you to repent but what is this repentance? we'll come to that in the future inshallah right now we just want to establish that everyone has to repent according to this verse for example in another verse chapter 49 verse 11 وَمَا لَمْ Whoever, whoever doesn't turn to Allah, whoever doesn't repent, whoever doesn't repent, they are one of the dhalimun. They've done something wrong. Whoever doesn't repent, this also shows whoever you are, you have to repent. And now, here, we have to explain. When the Imams, when the Prophets say, Dhalam to nafsi, they really believe they've wronged their souls. They really believe they've committed a dhul. They really believe they've committed a spiritual crime. But what is, what is it that they believe? Is it the Sharia sin? No, it can't be a Sharia sin. They're masoom. They're strong believers. But still something, according to themselves, they're doing something wrong. And they're repenting. Whoever you are, if you don't repent, you're one of the Dali according to this verse. So these verses show that it's necessary to repent, whoever you are. And even from a rational point of view, once you accept that sins 
pollutes the soul. It's a rational principle that you want to distance yourself from all kind of harm. Rationality tells you that. Even if these verses of the Quran didn't exist, even if there were no traditions, if you appreciate that sins pollute the soul, your act tells you, I want to distance from such contamination. The next issue is, is the necessity to repent immediate or can you delay it? Here too, our aqal, the intellect dictates that in the same way that we are harmed by a poison, we don't delay it, we go to the hospital immediately. Sins pollute the soul, pollute one, it pollutes one to a much greater degree than physical poison. This is spiritual poison. The soul is being contaminated. And so here too, one's rationality dictates that one has to repent immediately after sinning. He shouldn't let a delay arise. The more a delay arises, the more that spiritual pollution will set in. The more that sets in, the more difficult it will be for it to be removed. The next point in the fiqh of repentance is Repentance, the manner of repentance, depends on the sin also. If you remember, we said that the minimum for repentance, the minimum, is truly being remorseful. Truly being regretful that you've committed a sin. That's the minimum, the fiqhi minimum to repentance. However, there may be other things that need to be added. It all depends on the sin that you want to repent from. For example, sometimes the sin is haqqullah that you've trespassed upon. Sometimes it's haqqullahs. For example, if you committed, God forbid, for example, adultery behind closed doors, and no one got to know about it. You have to repent. And that repentance is being remorseful. That will suffice. Or for example, if you drank alcohol, God forbid. Repentance here, the minimum that is required is being remorseful that you drank alcohol. That's it, there's nothing else you can do. Or for example, you listen to haram music. Assuming the music was haram. Yeah, there's nothing that, all you have to do is repent. And that's being remorseful. I'll explain what it means to be remorseful in a minute. Just one point on music, just on the, on the margin. The way the Fogaho have described music is a very sensitive criteria and it depends on orf, on the common lay person where you live. So for you it would be for the common Joe blogs, for example, on the street, not the Muslims, the common Joe blogs where you live, so in Phoenix, for example. They say if they were to listen to a given music, would they say that this is Lahwi or not? That's the criteria. Would that common Joe blogs on the street, if they were to listen to a given music, would they say it is Lahwi or not? So the next question is, what does it mean to be Lahwi or not? They say, if a given music is on a par with Haram gatherings, gatherings of dance and drink, if a given music is on a par with such gatherings of drink and dance, that is lahwi. If you give a given music to someone in Phoenix, 
And they say, yes, this is, I, I do associate this. It's on a ball with, for example, gatherings of drugs or drinking or alcohol or dancing. That becomes that. It's Harold to this. Let's go back 400 years ago. Beethoven or Mozart. The music of Mozart was only played in gatherings of debauchery and drinking and dancing. 400 years ago, Mozart would have been haram to listen. But today, 400 years later, this music is not on a par with such gatherings. This classical music that we have today, Mozart, it, it doesn't, it's not haram to listen. You see, it changes. Some things in Islam changes with the times. Some things are absolute. For example, techno music, which is on a par, I don't know, but in, in, in X country, if it's on a par with dance and drink, it becomes how to listen. But in Iran, you listen to techno music, it's not on a par with such gatherings. It doesn't become how. So in one country it's not how, in one country it is. Now, the point I want to mention is, let's say there are two Muslims and they listen, one, one of them is listening to music. The other one shouldn't attack immediately and say it's haram. You have to give the benefit of the doubt that person has gone through the criteria and he or she has come to that conclusion. You may not accept it. You come to another conclusion, it doesn't matter. But the criterion is that, that each duty bound has to come to that conclusion him or herself. Anyway, some sense, all you have to do is be remorseful. That's it. Some sins which are hard or low, like zakat and khums, then, in addition to being remorseful, then you have to pay that zakat and khums that you didn't pay. Or if you didn't, for example, do salat, it's a sin. You have to repent and be remorseful and regret it. But in addition to that, you have to compensate the missed salats, the missed fasts. So there's an added element here. Or in Hakkonos, you've stolen something from someone, you've injured someone. In addition to repenting, there's an added repayment that you have to do. Then the next question is, is that added repayment, be it in Hakkonos or in Hakkonos, is it a prerequisite to the Torah? Okay. Is it part of the Torah? So two different questions. Is it a shard that wants Torah to be accepted? You have to do the repayment, be it the missalots, misfasts, re repay what you stole, and so on and so forth. Or with the backbiting example we gave a few days ago, doing and asking for forgiveness, assuming the person who was backbited got to know that you backbited against them. But is this added recompensation, or this added compensation of that, or repayment, is it a prerequisite, prerequisite to Torah and repentance? One question. Secondly, is it part of the Torah process? Here, the answer to both of them is no. It's neither a prerequisite to that being remorseful, and nor is it even part of the Torah. It's another Vajib action. Torah is Vajib. This repayment also is Vajib. It's like having two Vajib actions. And one Vajib action isn't dependent on the other. You have to do it. But it's, if you don't do it, you've sinned. But it doesn't mean your Torah will not be accepted. That's another point. The next point is this being remorseful. Yes, that is the minimum for Torah to be realized. However, this minimum requires a preceding and succeeding stage to it automatically. 
Because in order to be truly remorseful, you need to have knowledge of the severity of your sin and why it was contaminating. So you require knowledge. Without knowledge of the pollution of that sin, you can't be truly remorseful. So that also is part of the process of Tobe, to get knowledge of why that sin is contaminating. And then when you're remorseful, if you're truly remorseful, automatically the result will be that you have the iron will never to repeat that action again. That's also part of the Tobe process. With true remorse, that which follows is that you have the resolution not to repeat it again. If you don't have that resolution, that remorse wasn't complete. The Tobe is not complete yet. So in one discussion that they have, they say, is temporary repentance acceptable or not? Temporary repentance. For example, someone wants to go to Hajj, let's say a female Muslim, they want to go to Hajj, they don't have the hijab, for example. And when they want to go to Hajj, they repent, and in Hajj they want to have the hijab, but they know that when they come back, they will return to their ways again. Or a man drinks alcohol, God forbid, and when it's Muharram, they repent from drinking alcohol. And they don't drink alcohol for Muharram, for example. Then when that finishes, they know they'll return to drinking alcohol. This we call temporary repentance. Is that accepted? The answer is no, it's not accepted. Because part of the minimum to repentance was the resolution not to do it again. That's something which is a prerequisite. And that comes from true remorse. When someone knows from the beginning they're going to repeat, that means they're not truly remorseful for that action. Then there's another concept we have. It's that of partial repentance. Is that acceptable to partially repent? What does that mean? For example, someone has done many sins. They've done many sins. They repent from some of them, but they don't repent from others. Is that which they do repent for accepted, even though they haven't repented for their other actions? Or do they have to repent for all their actions for repentance to be accepted? Here, in the Imamiya school of thought, they accept partial repentance. So if you do a lot of sins, and you repent for some of them, even though you haven't repented for the other sins, that which you have repented for is accepted, but you still have to repent for the others. Yes, there may be exceptions. For example, you've done two sins. The ratio legis, the cause of the horma, the cause of the prohibition, the illa, of both is the same. For example, you drank this intoxicant and you drank another intoxicant. But you only repented for drinking this intoxicant, but they're both intoxicants. Here, that partial repentance won't be accepted because the cause of the prohibition in both is the same. Does it make sense for you to repent for drinking this intoxicant? That other thing was an intoxicant, even though it had another name. And there were many filthy rulings on repentance. These were some of the more important ones that we have. Okay. So coming back to that tradition, that whoever doesn't repent, they are one of the Dalimi. What does this mean? Here in Mosadir, in this tradition, he categorizes people depending on their degree in Iman. And he starts from the very beginning, the Awam, the common people like me and you, and he goes to the end, up to the Prophets. 
And in each class of people, he describes what their repentance entails, what their dolm and wrongdoing entails. And inshallah, for the next two or three nights, we'll go through different classes of people and explain the mechanisms and protocols of how to repent for each class. The first class are the awam. The common people like me and you, the common lay person may be divided into two. They are either ahlul ma'asir, people who sin, and that may include most of us. And there are some people who don't sin intentionally, or the common lay people like me and you, they're a minority, but they don't sin intentionally. They are ahlul ta'ah. They are obedient, abiding people. In any case, these common lay people, sometimes they're ahlul ma'asir, they're sinners, even though they're believers, but they sin now and again. And some of them, they don't sin intentionally, they're ahlul ta'a. These two, how do they repent? Let's start with the ahlul ma'asir, which includes most of us. How do they have to repent? The ethicists in Islam, they say that the first step, this is now practical, you know, these are practical steps of how to do Tawbah now. They say the first step is that the sinner must, the first thing that the sinner must acknowledge and repent from is deeming the seriousness of their sins as insignificant. Seeing sins as insignificant. That's the first step that we have to sort out. The Ahlul Maxia, the sinners, they belittle, they belittle the seriousness of sins. And this is the first step. That has to be solved before they can continue with other steps to succeed in their repentance. So the first question is, are there any signs or symptoms that exist that we can tell whether we are of this group or not? For example, me personally, I want to know, am I that kind of a person who belittles sins? Am I that kind of a person who deems sinning insignificant? Here the ulama, based on tradition from the Ahlul Bayt, they've given three signs and symptoms. That if we have these three, it shows that we are pertaining to this class of people. And we have to mend our ways. What are those three here? One is they see oneself as deserving to be forgiven. I'll explain all these one by one. They always see themselves as deserving to be forgiven. Secondly, when they are harming others, they are still at ease and peace with themselves. They're harming others, but they're still at ease with themselves. Their conscious conscience is still at ease. That's the second sign. And thirdly, they have close ties, close ties, okay? Not just any tie. They have close ties and affinity with people who are vicious and wrongdoers. So these are three signs that the ulama have spoken about. Now these three, if these three are sorted out, that first aspect of remorse, which was the 
basic minimum of repentance, that won't be realized. So these three signs or symptoms are a scaffolding to this acquiring remorse. So we have to see whether we are of the type that belittles sins or deem them as insignificant or not. Now let's just go through these three signs one by one, very briefly, but I think it's important. So, if someone, the first sign was if they see themselves as deserving to be forgiven, whatever sin they do, is it Allah will forgive. Allah will definitely forgive this. Here, this stance of deserving the forgiveness, when it's uttered in such a way by such people, it implies that one has considered this sinning as very lightly. They see it as an automatic that Allah will forgive. And they continue their ways. Or some of them will say, of course Allah will forgive. And they're very content with that. They're defining what Allah must or must not do. And as a result, they're seeing the sins and their sinning as very shallow. Such people usually, they belittle sins. They see it as insignificant. And if they do, acquiring that remorse is very difficult. These people who will say, of course Allah will forgive Allah will you don't see remorse or true regret in these people usually. Otherwise, if they had that true regret, they wouldn't have said that with that confidence. They would have kept on assigning themselves before the divine courtyard of Allah. Inshallah, He will forgive. Inshallah, our sins will be forgiven. The second sign is that these people, on harming others, they're still at peace with themselves. They're still okay with it. And this, they're harming other people. They're doing wrong to their spouses, their children. At the workplace, they may be stealing, they may be cheating. And although they're doing all this, they're still very confident and tranquil with themselves. They have no inner distress with themselves. And this shows they've belittled sins. This is the second sign. They've belittled sins. They've deemed sinning as insignificant. And this, if one doesn't repent, if this becomes a habit, it becomes very difficult to reverse one's ways. You fall into certain actions that then you just regard as normal after a while. Why? Because you've belittled or deemed those actions as insignificant. And that's inhibited you from acquiring that true remorse. It's interesting that sometimes people ask questions that, for example, now we're in this land, can we sometimes steal something from the workplace? No, they're not Muslims after all. Can we do it from the cafe? And that. Although, from a friendly point of view, many marriages say it's haram. No, there may be one or two marriages, I don't know. But the position is stealing is haram, whoever it's from. I don't want to enter the friendly discussion here. But look, you're a Shia of Amir al Mu'minin alayhi salam. You see, it's important this. When you look at it from an ethical point of view, your leader, that that you regard as a role model, he's given the famous statement of Wallahi law u'tito al-aqalim as-sab'a bima tahta aflakiha bi an a'si Allah fi namlatin julb al-sha'ir a'khudha ma fa'at ma fa'at if I was to be given all the world, all the world, in exchange for taking 
a small grain away from an ant. Okay? I will do it. See? He's someone who never belittles any kind of sin. Doesn't even deem the smallest kind of sins as insignificant. But this is taking from an ant. We have problems with taking from other people. See, this is important. Shiism isn't a conventional, it's a body, arbitrary matter. Shiism is a function of the heart. When those traditions speak of when the 12th Imam comes, a group of Christians will accept him. Those Christians were pure. The heart was pure. The fitzah was pure. Okay, they didn't have any access to Islam. But that which they had access to, they had it purely. Aqamid is a function of the fitra. Aqamid isn't acquired through knowledge. The fitra has to build a knot with Aqamid. The heart has to incorporate Aqamid and Akhra. Those Christians, the heart, the fitra was intact. Who recognizes the 12th Imam? Not the person who's just read about him and knows all the signs. The person with a pure heart will recognize the 12th Imam when he comes. It's not, a, it's not a guarantee for Muslims. That's why in the traditions, many ulama, God forbid, like me, they're going to reject the 12th Imam. And that's something very scary. Why? They, they know all the signs of the 12th Imam. But they reject him because the heart was impure. The heart was impure. Then a Christian whose heart was pure did not accept the truth the Lord. There's no room for complacency. We don't know how we're going to be judged. Then someone who's a Hindu, who's a Christian, anything, who acted on a par with this action of Amir al Mu'minin, of course they're going to benefit. How much I don't know. But they're manifesting this trait of Amir al Mu'minin. Just because you're born a Muslim, it doesn't give a God given right that everything you're going to be superior from beginning to the end from all kinds of non Muslims. It's not as simple as that. But our leader wouldn't take a small grain from an ant. I'm not saying you can have that level, but at least be embarrassed when you want to steal from a person. Don't belittle, you know, the absolutes. Once a student called his spiritual mentor. These things are things which have happened. It's been narrated to us. If you think it's a bit utopian, you know, the, the, the stages of Iman, it differs from people to people. The student contacted the mentor and started crying. The mentor said, why are you crying? He said, I've sinned. The mentor said, why? He said, I killed an insect for no reason. See? Now, killing an insect isn't haram from a filthy point of view. And even in an ethical point of view, if the insect is harming you, you can get rid of it. If it's not harming you, there's no need from an ethical point of view. But anyway, if there's a need or there's no need, from a filthy point of view, it's not haram. See, this person it bothered his fitra. It bothered him. He was asking for repentance from this mentor. And then we, we bite, we sting our fellow Muslims. We hurt our fellow Muslims. So definitely haram. And then it becomes habit. See, it shouldn't be made habit. Once it becomes habit, it, you start belittling. Once you start belittling and deeming these sins as insignificant, you won't get to stage one of two. That remorse will never arise.
And the third sign is being in affinity with or having close ties with those who commit vice, the vicious people. People who are indifferent to the do's and don'ts of religion. They're, in, it's, they're indifferent to it. They commit vice. What religion says, they don't listen to. What akhlaq says, they don't listen to. These kind of people. The third sign, if you want to say you are of the class of people who belittle sins or deems sins as insignificant, you have an affinity with or close ties. Not any old time. Again, we have to work with people, we have to associate with people. But once you see you're having an affinity with these people, Yes, that's a sign that you may be belittling sins. For example, you know that X person does Y or Z sin, but you still associate with them and you're close with them. You don't do Amr bin Ma'roof. Amr bin Ma'roof, it has degrees. You don't even frown a little when they do that in front of you, that sin. It doesn't even bother you inside. You don't even speak with them very gently so that they mend with their ways. No, you're very close with them. That's not a good sign. You won't succeed in Tawbah because that remorse is very difficult for it to arise now. So if you do associate closely with such people, it shows that you've taken sins very lightly. Because if you were the type who didn't belittle sins and you took them very seriously, you would have always taken a different approach. You would have done something. Now that doesn't mean you have to isolate yourself from those people. No. al hobbo asasi, the Holy Messenger said. Compassion, love, is my first course of action. You always have to care for people, even for the sinner. We don't like sins. We hate sins. But we don't hate the sinner. The sinner is a person, is a creation of Allah. The sin we hate. So even with those people, I don't mean we have to isolate ourselves from them. We have to care for them. We want to care for their fate. We don't want them to end in a bad fate. That kind of compassion has to be there. Yes. If you feel you can't express that compassion, and if you feel that if you associate, it will harm your faith, your faith will be compromised. If your Iman is of that level, yes, don't associate at all. Because you can't compromise with your own faith. But still, you have to have that caring aspect to yourself in relation to your neighbors, Muslim or non-Muslim. So these were the three signs. If anyone observe, if anyone observes such signs within them, they have to make amends before proceeding with the succeeding steps of repentance. And here, making amends here is that knowledge. The reason why you're belittling sins, you're deeming them as insignificant, you don't have enough knowledge of what sins are. You have to go back, study sins, see what their effects are, why they are bad. Then this will help you to avoid those three signs and symptoms. And then that will help you to have that minimum remorse which enables one to realize Torah, inshallah. Tomorrow, inshallah, we'll speak of the Ahl Taha, what is their repentance. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahumma salli ala